but with God, all things are possible. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. This is the gift of God. And God demonstrates. in the same goal. But our mission at Dogwood Church is to make more and better Christ followers who love God and who love people. And uh, when the Real Life Center was first started, it was started out of a heart to meet that loving people part of the mission statement, to help love and serve people in our community. And so Kristen, uh, I get asked a lot, you know, we talk about the Real Life Center a lot mm -hmm. and uh, we talk about it a lot from the stage as well. But I still get asked a lot of questions, you know, what exactly does the Real Life Center do? And so could you just spend a moment and tell us what is it that the Real Life Center does to meet that mission and to love and serve people in our community here? Absolutely, yes. Um, so the Real Life Center, we serve families right here in our own community um, that are really hurting and going through difficult times. Uh, oftentimes the families that come to us find themselves in a situation, in a crisis situation. Um, and they just don't know where to turn to. So um, we, we strive to provide a safe environment um, for families to come when they are going through difficult times. So um, one way we're able to do that um, is, is help meet physical needs. Um, and uh, oftentimes that involves uh, providing food for their families, um, sometimes uh, helping financially um, mm -hmm. with paying a bill or something along those lines. Okay. Um, but more importantly, uh, we see that uh, when we meet those physical needs, when they're in, um, in crisis, it not only meets that physical need, but it also provides hope. So uh, that's one of the you know, biggest gifts we can give someone that, that's um, going through difficult times. So um, there's that, but also um, our programs along with um, referrals um, for other resources in the community are really designed uh, to, to provide stability and promote long-term change, which can, which can really help these families in the long run. Yeah, well, I love that. That's amazing. And you know, one of the things I love, uh, I love being a part of a church that, that values these things and has made it, uh, making an intentional effort to meet these needs with people. But um, so not only are we able to meet physical needs and even help people with their emotional needs, but we're also able to help people with their spiritual needs because at these appointments that you're talking about and when people come into the Real Life Center, it also gives us an opportunity to share the gospel. Is that correct? Absolutely, yes. Um, that is a huge part of what we do at the Real Life Center is, is sharing the love of Christ with the families that come to us. Awesome, well, I love that. Well, Kristen, tell us a little bit more about your specific role and what you do at the Real Life Center to love and care for and serve the people in our community. Sure, yes. Um, so I'm extremely blessed to be the food drive coordinator Okay. There. Um, so basically what I get to do is work uh, with with people in the community, uh, churches, businesses, organizations, schools. I'm really blessed wow. to be that uh, point person to coordinate the food drives um, and just to see how God uses people in our community to really bless those that are going through hard times. Wow, I love that. So Kristen, tell me, how many food drives a year do you think you guys do? Well, um, off the top of my head, it's it's a bit too much to count, but wow. <laughs> I'd say just during the holiday season, we usually have at least at least thirty. Wow, so, thirty food drives just during the holiday season. Yes, that's that's definitely a busy time of year. But we, there's a great need, I guess, at that time of year. Yes, yes, we do oftentimes get busier, uh, but we do like to keep food drives going year round. So wow, that's mm -hmm. incredible. Um, you know, I often get asked by people in our church, you know, people who have a heart to serve other people, people who have a heart to love on other people, what can I do to do something physical and tangible and kind of directly serve people in our community? And, you know, we'll always point them towards the Real Life Center. So what kind of opportunities are out there for people who want to help and serve people in our local community? Well, one easy but very important way um, everyone can help is, is to pray. So, um, keep the yeah. Real Life Center families that come to us, mm -hmm. our leadership and your prayers. Yeah. Um, another way you can help is by giving. There's mm -hmm. many ways to do that. Uh, you could go directly to the Real Life Center webpage. Um, you Tell can, us the Real Life Center webpage. Yes, it's uh, reallifecenter.org. Perfect, mm -hmm. okay. So you can go there to give uh, mm -hmm. monetary donations. Um, and a third way is to actually serve. So uh, it actually takes 
um, lots of volunteers to make a good I can imagine. Su successful yeah. life center day that we're open serving families. So, um, so yes, we're always in need of, of some help. Um, one way to find out, um, you know, how you can plug in is just to go to our our webpage okay. um, and reach out through that way. And if there's service opportunities, then we'll get back, Perfect. back with you on that. So you can just go to reallifecenter.org mm -hmm. and you can sign up to be a volunteer. Mm -hmm. You can give to the Real Life Center monetarily to help people as well in that way. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, well, before you go today, uh, there's something going on right now that people mm -hmm. can be a part of to help serve the people in our community. And that is a food drive we're doing here at the church, which we mentioned last week if you were in our services. And so we sort of sent a list out with everybody last week to bring food items back here this week. So Kristen, uh, can you tell us what should people do if they did bring food back and if they didn't bring food back uh, because they weren't here last week or forgot about it? Or there are so many people also who live outside of our ministry area who might mm -hmm. want to participate in this as well. How can everybody participate in this? Sure, yes. Uh, well, one way, uh, if you did bring food this Sunday, then uh, we'll have the truck parked out front. So all you have to do is just hand it to us Perfect. and we'll get it back uh, down to the center. And uh, if you forgot your food, but you would like to give in another way, we do have a table set up out front as well where you can give your monetary donation. Right here in the lobby today at church? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yep, okay. and you can just put a little note on there, you know, designated for food. Okay. Um, or you can go online um, uh, and give um, a donation through that, through the website. Uh, and, uh, or you can always drop your food donations off during our open hours. Just drop by during your regular, regular business hours. Absolutely. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So again, there's an opportunity for every one of us. If you brought your food, just drop it off at the truck. But if you, if you didn't, and again, if you live outside of our ministry area here, you can still be a part of what God is doing through the food drive and through the Real Life Center by going to the website at reallifecenter.org and you can give there at that time as well. Kristen, thank you so much for everything that you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing to serve the families in our community who are in need of that help. And uh, we're so grateful for you and grateful for the Real Life Center. So and thank you for being here today with us. Thank you for having me and yeah. thank you and thank you all for uh, we couldn't do what we do at the Real Life Center without your support. So awesome. we're so grateful. Awesome. Well, again, welcome. Again, the service is about to start here in just a moment, but I wanna encourage everybody one more time to share the service, uh, share a link with someone, share the feed on your social media page. But again, we're so glad all of you are here. The service is about to start.
was in someone's mind. All right. Thank you guys. Give them a hand. Great job. What a way to start the service today. How's everybody doing today? Well, welcome to Dogwood Church. It's so great to see if you're in the room or if you're outside or on campus somewhere else, or if you're watching online, welcome. We're so glad that all of you are here. It's a great day to be here. We are in our second week of our fall spiritual growth campaign, our brand new series called What the World Needs Now, Loving Others Like Jesus. And I think that song beautifully frames where we're going this morning. I think it beautifully frames where I think God wants to lead us today because love really plays a very significant role in all of our lives. And whether we wanna admit it or not, every single person has a deep-seated desire to love and to be loved and to know and to be known. Last week, if you were here, we talked about the indescribable, unmeasurable love of God and how God has shown us His love through His Son, Jesus, but continues to show us His love by giving us life and breath and purpose and a promise of a future and a promise of eternity. And this week and in the weeks to come, this series is gonna continue to build and we're gonna talk about how we can be propelled out of the love of God and compelled out of the love of God to love other people, even when we disagree, even when we don't see eye to eye, even when people are difficult to love. And I think if we can do that, we truly can change the world around us. And that is what the world needs right now. So again, welcome. We're so glad that all of you are here to be a part of that with us today. You know, our heart and our prayer is to serve everybody who's connected to Dogwood Church. And so we want as many people as possible to come to know who Jesus is is as their savior, but also to spend the rest of their life growing in their faith and their love for him. And the best way to keep going on that journey and to start on that journey is one simple step by letting us know each week that you're here uh, and a part of our gatherings on Sundays. Again, whether you're here or you're watching online, let me tell you how you can let us know. You can fill out our Dogwood response card. And there's several ways that you can do that. The first one is simply to text the word CONNECT to 770 770- 285-1792. If you haven't already saved that number in your phone, I want to encourage you to do that. We use it for all kinds of different things. You can also go to our website at dogwood.church slash connect. Or if you're watching on social media, you can click on the pinned comment under the comments you see there in the feed. You know, one amazing thing that's happened, uh, we've been regathered in person now uh, for several weeks But every single week, we've had a large group of people set foot on this campus for the very first time. A lot of guests have been coming since we've regathered in person. And if that's you today, if you're here for the first time, I wanna extend a special welcome to you. We are honored that you made us a part of your morning today. And we have a gift that we would like to give you just to thank you for being here. And so at the end of the service, you can just head out the doors and to the guest table outside and pick that up. One of our team members would love to answer any questions that you have and have the opportunity to meet you as well. well what I wanna do right now is I wanna invite all of you to stand up with me, if you will. Singing is a very big part of our gatherings every week because singing is an expression of joy. And we have joy because of the love that our Father has lavishly poured out on us. And that's what these songs are about. And so I wanna invite every single one of you. I know it's awkward to be in here with masks. I know it's not fun to sing in them, but let's let our God hear us. Let's lift these songs up as our prayers to Him right now as we sing. Here we go. And I serve the world It couldn't feel me A man's empty praise And treasures of faith Yeah. 
sing before he spoke before he spoke creation the god of heaven knew our names formed in his reflection we are his glory
Amen. Let's give God praise today for that. Yeah. Amen. I want to invite you guys to be seated where you are. You know, in a world with so much of a love deficit right now, such a scarcity of love, that last song reminds me, you know, for those of us who are in Christ, for those of us who have faith in Christ, that makes us family in Christ. You know, we're not a family who's united by having a similar appearance, physical appearance. We're not a family that's united in having the same opinions all the time or even the same views on every single issue, but we are a family who is supposed to be united in our love for Christ and united in our love for one another. That's the kind of family that we're supposed to be. And, you know, I think that a lot of the problems in the world that we're seeing right now, we feel like the solution is to bring people around to our point of view or have people convince people to feel the same way that we feel when maybe the solution is we should be inviting more people to share in the family of God. Because in the family of God, everybody is offered forgiveness. In the family of God, everybody gets a seat at the table. In the family of God, everybody gets a loving father who is with them and who is for them. And I believe that is what the world needs now. I think that's why this series is so important. You know, as important as I believe this series is, this series is just a small part. It's just a small expression of what we do as a church all the time. You know, our mission as a church is to make more and better Christ followers who love God and who love other people all the time. Every day of every year, that's our mission. That's what we're working towards. And so as we move into a time of giving right now, I just wanna remind us that when you give to God through Dogwood Church, you're making an investment in the family of God. You're helping more people come to know Jesus. When you give to God through Dogwood Church, you're helping more people love people better all the time. And when you give to God through Dogwood Church, you're helping more people rightly understand and rightly follow Jesus. Amen. I believe if we can get more people to look a little more like Jesus, this world can be a better place. Can I get an amen to that? You know, it's funny, if you read in scripture and you see a moment where Jesus encountered somebody who looked completely different than him or thought completely different than him, they didn't walk away feeling condemned. They didn't walk away feeling judged. They didn't even walk away feeling like Jesus won the argument. They walked away saying, that man loved me and that man cared about me. And that's how Jesus changed the world. And he invites us to be a part of that as well. So when you give to Dogwood Church, you're making an investment in the loving family of God. So we're gonna have the opportunity to do that again together right now. So I wanna tell you how you can make that investment, how you can give to God through Dogwood. It's gonna come up on the screen. You can text the word GIVE to 770-285-1792. You can also go to our website at dogwood.church slash give. You can mail a check to the church office or automate it through your bank. My wife and I have been doing that for many years. You can also, if you're here in person, when you leave today, there are black boxes at every exit with a little sign that says how you can give above them and you can drop your offering in there as well. And so let's make that investment in the family of God together again as a church right now. Well, in just a few more moments, we're gonna invite Pastor Keith Moore up as we go into week two of our series. But before we do that, I wanna pray if you guys will bow your heads with me. Lord, thank you so much for this day. And Lord, as we... Give these offerings today, Lord, as we offer this up to you. I pray that the posture of our hearts, Lord, is that everything that we have, God, belongs to you. And God, I pray that you would take it and you would amplify it and magnify it and do more with it than we could ever ask or imagine, God, because that's just who you are. And God, in the coming moments, as we open your word and we, and we hear your word, God, I pray that we would not just be people who hear your word. I pray that it would not just sit in this room. God, I pray that we would act upon what we're learning and what we're hearing and we would be doers of your word. God, let us be those kinds of people. God, we pray for change in our world. We pray for change in our country. But God, let us not just pray for it. Let us not just shout about it or, or talk about it, but God, let it begin with us. 
Let it begin with our hearts and in our minds, Lord, and let it begin today. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good morning to all of you in the room and good morning to all of you out on the patio. I've got to admit to all of you who are outside on the patio, I'm waving at you right now. I wish I was preaching out there. It's so beautiful. And, uh, but you guys look pretty good in here, too. Welcome to everybody online. And uh, we are in our, as you've already heard, our second week of our uh, fall spiritual growth campaign, uh, What the World Needs Now, Loving Others Like like Jesus. And um, again, you've already heard this too, but I like to say it often. Jesus Christ, rightly understood and rightly followed, turns us into people who love God and love people. And um, we're spending uh, five weeks together as the Dogwood Church family, uh, focusing on this issue even more than we usually do. Now, we hammer it all the time uh, because 
uh, we believe what the Bible teaches that uh, personally for you and me, the, the, uh, one of the great outcomes of fo- rightly understanding and following Jesus is that we uh, learn to love God completely. We learn to love others compassionately and we learn to love ourselves uh, correctly. But many of us human beings, well, we all of us human beings have a problem, don't we? We don't love people like Jesus, or we find that we have a limited uh, capacity to love other people like Jesus uh, commanded and like Jesus did and like Jesus uh, does. And not only are we limited in it, we're not making any progress. Uh, So today is a progress check for you uh, and me. I hope it's going to be wildly uncomfortable for you because I got really uncomfortable myself working through this passage and I want to share the discomfort around a little bit uh, today at, um, because we come to a, a passage of scripture that God gives us as, a, as kind of a, a self-inventory, uh, a checklist to see how we're doing, how, how we're doing in this This journey uh, of loving God completely, loving others compassionately, and loving ourselves um, correctly. Now, one of the reasons that we have difficulty with this, there are many reasons, but one of the reasons is we may not know what love is. And uh, so uh, the good news is, is God does not leave us with that question unanswered. And um, you can learn what love is by discovering God's description, God's very own uh, description. And it's found in the the passage of Scripture we're going to unpack today. So here's what I'd like for you to do. Locate in your Bibles, uh, over in the New Testament, the little book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you have a digital copy, go there. Hard copy, go there. Uh, If you have your campaign guidebooks, you can turn to... I, I think the sermon notes for today are on page like 75, 76. What is it? 76. 76 thank you. And uh, the scripture, we got the scripture printed out there for you. Remember, it's always important to have the scriptures because the only time you can be certain that God is speaking in a worship service is when the scriptures are being read. So have them in front of you. And um, here we go. You follow along, and I'm going to read aloud. Excuse me. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, But have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes... The imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection in a mirror, as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. This is God's word. Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes, that we may see wonderful things from your word as the psalmist prayed. And we pray also that you would open our minds 
as the Scripture says, that we may rightly understand the Scriptures. And we give you thanks for these things. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So, do you want to know what love is? Well, we look at this passage. And first of all, in your notes, jot this down. He says, first of all, love is essential. Love is essential. Uh, in, the, in verses 1 through 3 that I just read to you and that you have there, you'll find that the Apostle Paul, uh, inspired by God's Holy Spirit a little over a couple of thousand years ago, uh, was um, writing to the Christians in the church in the city of Corinth, ancient city uh, on the Mediterranean, um, very cosmopolitan. It was a it was a, a, a center of pagan religions and a center of uh, it was kind of an entertainment city. Kind of put New Orleans and Vegas in a blender and hit the button. You, 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 a lot of people, they came, people came there for entertainment and, um, from all over the world, uh, a business center, and uh, Paul had planted a church there. Now, these Christians in that church were first generation believers. So they're all baby Christians. They're all learning. They didn't have the New Testament. They, they were getting these, the scriptures as they were revealed by, by God, and this letter became part of our scriptures. Uh, they were, uh, they had a lot of problems. Bill, they had a lot of problems in this church because it was a church full of baby Christians. Just like and if you take the metaphor of infants in your home, you know, infants poop their pants a lot. And you get stinks up the place and you got to clean up messes and all this kind of kid until you get them raised. Well, this church was a wonderful church, but it was full of problems that churches that are full of, of new believers and immature believers have. And so Paul is writing this uh, this letter to bring some instruction and correction and blessing to uh, this church family. One of the problems that they had was this. Uh, they had, uh, like all believers, and just like you, whether you know it or not, if you're a follower of Jesus, God gives spiritual gifts to believers at the point they become Christians, special spiritual abilities that enable us to serve Christ's purposes and advance the kingdom of heaven in this world. And they're varied gifts, all kinds of, of, kinds of gifts. Well, these, um, one of the problems that the, the Christians in the church at Corinth had is they became so enamored with these new spiritual abilities, uh, some to preach and teach, some to serve, uh, uh, some to, you know, to, to do all kinds of things, that they they began to brag about their giftedness and it became, they became more important to them than the actual relationship with the Lord themselves. Long story, a lot we could talk about that and someday we'll come back to it. Just know this, uh, it was causing problems inside the church and outside the church with the unbelievers that uh, they were in contact with. And so Paul is writing here to put things in proper perspective. 1 Corinthians chapters 12 13 and 14 are all about the context of solving this problem. So right in the middle, he gives the great solution. And it's that your priority is to be love. Your priority is to be love. In fact, it is essential. You can do without these spiritual gifts one day. They're going to pass away. But this is essential. Love is the most important, um, important thing. And so he gives four examples. Here you go. He gives four examples. First of all, in verse 1, he said, If I, if I have eloquent, uh, impressive language, magnificent speech, maybe I even speak in the tongues of angels. I can speak the language of, of uh, angels. Uh, if, I don't have, if I'm not a loving person, my ability to communicate is useless. And he compares it to an irritating noise uh, like a... Um, like a screeching metal gate uh, that is being opened. It's, it's just it's, it's an irritating noise, uh, noise but no communication. He says it's like a like a, a clashing, uh, clanging of a cymbal. Uh, how many of you have really wished you could sneak in here sometime and get into what we call the drummer aquarium? over here and take the drumsticks and just beat the tar out of these things including the cymbals go ahead and confess it anybody we got a we 
they're a little more caught. Uh, the whole we need to watch out for the first service, Chad. They're out of control. Y'all were a little more cautious. Everybody did then. But imagine if I got uh, Chad Crouch, our uh, worship pastor, to get in here, and while I'm speaking, he just starts clanging the cymbals. Well, pretty soon that would be irritating. Very soon, very soon, and it's just. And he says, "If I don't have love, no matter how eloquent and impressive my speech, I'm just noise, and of no use." Second example, he says, "If I speak God's word with power," and he said, "If I understand uh, all of the, I have the gift of prophecy." Now, that gift of prophecy meant the the forth forth telling and proclaiming of God's message. Not seeing the future, but proclaiming the scriptures. If I had the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries, he meant the, the theological mysteries of God and all of his will and his ways. All of the things in the scriptures that you might not fully understand. Is if, if I had the ability, I was such a great teacher. Nathan, here's how I said it. Nathan's our associate student minister. Nathan, he said, if I had the ability to fully explain the Holy Trinity to eighth grade boys. Now, buddy, that'd be a theologian, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? And uh, he said, if I had the ability to do that, yet I didn't love people, nothing. I am a zero. Third, in verse two, he said, if I had great, great faith to do miracles like move mountains, like to say to Stone Mountain, uh, uh, jump and Go land in Lake Lanier, and it would do it. He said, but I, I don't have love. He said, I am, I am nothing. And that word nothing there means, uh, how's I going to say this? It means like a zero with the rim kicked off. That's what that word means. I mean, less than nothing. Less than nothing. And in, in the fourth example, he says, if I, if I perform the most unselfish acts and religious acts of devotion... If I, if I gave all of my money to the poor, uh, historians tell us, uh, the, the, the ancient historians tell us that in that day, there, uh, there were a people who competed to show how unselfish they were. It was an external thing. There were people who actually, we have in the history books, who would sell, sell themselves into slavery and then give the proceeds to the poor. Now, that's... that's that's radical, don't you think? That's not a trick question, don't you think? Yeah, good grief. Yeah, he, uh, he says, if I gave all of my money to, to the poor, or if he says, if I gave my body to be burned. Now, let's think about that for a second. Uh, somewhere along in this time period, we had the, the emperor Nero. We've mentioned him in our study through First Peter. And Nero persecuted the Christians. One of the things he would do, uh, the historians tell us, is that he would take Christians, he would arrest them, and then they would dress them in these shirts or robes that had been dipped several times in, in kind of a wax or paraffin, a flammable material, dress them in, in those robes, strap them to poles in his garden, and as they were having parties, they would light them and burn, and burn them to death. And so he's saying here, e even if I willingly gave my body to be burned because of my faith in Christ, it, which is upside down. You don't voluntarily become a martyr. But he said, if I, if I did, I signed up. I'm giving my body to be burned. He said, if I gave all my money to the poor, if I gave my body to be burned, but if I'm not a loving person, um, there's no value. There is no gain here at all. No matter what I say, no matter what I believe, nor what I do, I am bankrupt without love. So he is, he is hammering this point of love is essential, love is what is essential, love is what is essential, love is what is essential. It's the big outcome of rightly understanding and rightly following our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. So if this is the big point, <clears throat> then it would be nice if you and I knew what it looks like, what love behaves like. 
And then the Apostle Paul gives us the description. Here's the checklist. Write this down. Number two, love's basic qualities. Uh, and we have verses four through seven. Now, I'm, they're, they're going to stay up on the screen. I'm going to crawl through these. And here we go. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always <clears throat> perseveres. Now, this is interesting. In this checklist, he gives us several things that love does and several things he describes love, here's what it does, here's what it does not do. And a uh, pretty good checklist here. This is, now you may have come to the Bible, so sometimes people will say, Pastor, I just don't understand the Bible, it's just it's hard for me to understand. Not this verse, not this passage. This passage, verses 4 through 7, is one of the most clear and understandable passages uh, uh, in ancient literature, certainly in the Bible. It needs very little explanation, so here we go. Now, here's the checklist. How are you doing? How are you doing? Examine yourself before the Lord. Open up your heart. Lord, how am I doing in this thing? Because you've said love is essential, and it even gets pretty radical. We're going to talk about it. I told you in week five, he goes all the way to, yeah, it's essential even to your enemies. He actually expects us to love our enemies. Here we go. You ready? He says love is patient. That's a darn good start. Love, never, love is patient in relationships. It doesn't give up. doesn't give up. He says love is kind. It means love cares more for others than for self. Now, that's a big statement because I naturally, you know, I love me a lot. <laughs> How about you? You love you a lot? Sure. We, naturally, we, we do. And, we, and we're to love ourselves correctly, but... I, you know, I, my natural tendency is to love me way more than I love you and be more concerned about me than you. But kindness cares more for others than self. Love, then he gets into some of the negative descriptions. Love is not envious. In other words, love doesn't want what others have that it does not have. Uh, it never boils over with jealousy saying, well, why not me? Why them? No, love never says that. Uh, love is not boastful. It doesn't strut or brag. Love is not proud. It, proud in the sense of, of, of seeing that I, I am taking a position of uh, superiority over some other people. Love is never proud of self to the point that it looks down on other people. Those of us who know that we are saved by grace through faith alone in Christ alone know that we have absolutely no grounds for, uh, for thinking ourselves better than other people. Uh, none. None at all. None at all. And love does not look down on others. It is not puffed up. Love is not rude, which is a great indication that we live in a very unloving culture. Because I'm telling you, the, the, the culture, general culture of the United States of America is rude. It, it's been interesting over the years, even in our entertainment. Uh, uh, as a kid growing up watching television, we went from the hero to the anti-hero. Um, where where the, 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 the main character in our television series and our, uh, our novels and in our movies, uh, they're rude people. And we like that. A few years ago, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not travel. I don't travel much. Um, I've not traveled outside of the country much. I think I went to Vidalia once, uh, but that's been about it for me. You know, I wanted to see where the onions came from. And but uh, a few years ago, I, I was on a trip to um, El Salvador, and I was in the country for eleven days. I was visiting a church pastor and church. Uh, in the city of San Salvador, had a wonderful time in that, um, in that warm culture. You know, that's a very, Central America is a very warm culture. Relationally is what I'm speaking, not temperature, relationally. Uh, gracious, warm people, the believers I met and the unbelievers. Very gracious, very, very gracious. Now, I was there for 11, only, only out of the country for 11 days, Dave. Only 11 days. 
And then the Saturday came, I, had, I flew, got on the plane, flew home. Uh, it was about a, about a three-hour flight, something like that, up to, to Houston Continental. And I, I got off the plane and went in to the terminal and was immediately struck with how rude everybody was. Now, many of you know what I'm talking about. When you get out of our USA culture for even a matter of days and you come back, Lord, help us. Love is not that way. Love is not rude. Love does not force itself on others. Love is not self-seeking. It is not always me first. In, in other words, this is a... This says love is not always insisting on its rights. Sometimes love is willing to give up its rights for others. Now, again, we citizens of the United States, one of our favorite documents is the Bill of Rights. And we, we, we stand up for our rights. We fight for our rights. And there's a right way to go about that. But um, he says here, love is not always just spending its time trying to insist on its own rights. Love is not easily angered. Here we go. He, he means here love doesn't fly off the handle or quickly lose its temper. One translation makes it even rougher on us. He says, love is not provoked. Love, love is never provoked to anger. And uh, I have found myself at times easily provoked to anger. Unfortunately, it's even with the people that's closest to me. And so, whoa, Lord, help, help me with that one. Uh, love keeps no record of wrongs. It doesn't keep, in other words, it doesn't keep score of the sins of others, people we know and people we don't know. Again, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, we're in this series in the context of a national election in a divided country. And where we love with our political enemies, or, or uh, that we, we might not want to use that word, but we might view them that way, we love to keep a record of their wrongs. Uh, keeps no record of wrongs, never harbors evil thoughts about others. Love doesn't keep score in relationships. It doesn't hold a grudge. Love never says to someone, I owe you one, or you owe me one, or now you owe me. That's, that is not a love relationship. That is, a, I want everything to be equal. I don't want to be accountable to anybody else. Love doesn't keep record of who owes who. or never, Love never says, now we're even, which means I'm done with you. In fact, the Bible says for us Christians, we are always in debt to other people. We, are, we always owe them the debt of loving them, the book of Romans tells us. Always. We're never freed from that from that indebtedness to love other, other people. Love never, de he's, love never delights in evil. Never glad when wrong is done. Doesn't revel when others grovel. Love rejoices in the truth. When truth wins out, love takes great pleasure in the truth and glad when truth prevails. Now, I like this next phrase. Love always protects. Now, that word protects there in, in this original uh, language can also be translated conceals. Love conceals. Well, conceals what? Conceals what? It, it conceals in a protective uh, sense here. Uh, the meaning here is that, that love conceals what we discover is displeasing in the life and personality of other people. Uh, rather than dragging it out into the light of the public eye to be criticized and made fun of, which is what we, or we tend to do on social media all the time. We find it, did you hear about? Did you, I'm only repeating it because it's true. God says there are some things that are true and you shouldn't repeat them. Not if you're my children. Not if you love people. And we always look at it, so love doesn't, doesn't do that. Love always trusts. Trusts God always. But not only, God, not only is God referred to here, it means that love is always ready to allow for difficult circumstances in other people's lives and, and, 
intentionally looks for the best in others, not the worst. Not the worst. Uh, Love is always eager to believe the best about other people. Um, I've told you this story before about uh, a dear lady um, in our lives from years ago in our church in Texas. We called her Grandmother Draper. And her son told us this story about her. She was one of the most loving, gracious people and positive people uh, that I've ever met. She was with her sister one time. And her sister was talking about another relative that they were having difficulties for. And Grandmother Draper just kept saying nice things about her. And, she's, and her sister got mad at her. And she said, oh, Ruth, you, you, you're just naive. You just don't understand people. You, you say good things about everybody. You, you'd even say something good about the devil. And she paused a second. Grandmother Draper did. And she said, well, he is a hard worker. So, love prefers finding the good in, in other, other people. Uh, now, love is not gullible. No, no, no. In fact, the love of Christ, Jesus said that we're to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. Love's not gullible. It is not gullible, but it is also not cynical. Also not cynical. It does not think the worst about people at the beginning and love always hopes always looks for the best always keeps up hope in the grace of God to redeem relationships it always trusts in the grace of God is powerful enough to redeem our relationships you know I I've I've lived longer than probably the majority of you in this room I'm 68 years old in my 69th year hard to believe that uh, but and so I've lived long enough that I've had more opportunity to step on the relationships in my life and wound other people. I mean, I know you can't believe it, but there are people who have stopped, who have deleted my photo from their phone, and they don't. And old people don't carry. There's some that don't carry my photo in their wallet anymore. And uh, and and all of my relationships are not reconciled. They're not, but I want them to be. And one of my prayers, at least monthly, as I work through the blueprint of life that God has worked out from His Word for me, is I, as I pray for those relationships. And I pray, Lord, before I die, would you, I'm trusting in your grace that somehow we'd be able to reconcile these relationships. And I've, I know I've identified them. Well, love, love goes there. And always hopes in the grace of God. Love always perseveres, he says, never looks back, keeps going to the end, gives us the power to endure these things. Now, close your eyes for just a second. We're still, this isn't the end of the talk. It almost is. But just take a second, just close your eyes to kind of get a little bit of isolation right there where you are in that chair and play back, the, start playing back the tape of your life. Listen to the way you speak to and about others. Look at how you appear, the way you treat other people. Does this description of love that God has given here sound like you? How are you doing? How are you doing? Well, the Apostle Paul, okay, amen. The Apostle Paul wraps this up by nailing this down. Love is not only essential, it not only has all of these qualities, but it is also permanent. It is permanent. He, he says in verses 18, 8 through 13, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. He's talking about all of these spiritual gifts and ministries while we're still serving here on earth before Jesus returns. He says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. We don't understand fully things here and we're just doing our best. He said, but when perfection comes, when Jesus comes and redeems all things and wraps up time in eternity... Um, uh, the, the imperfect will pass away. He says, when I was a ch- it will be like a child. When I, talk, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. He says, the day's coming 
when I'll have a more mature understanding of these things. He says, now we see a, a poor reflection in a mirror, like a, like a mirror that has been smoke damaged. We don't actually get an accurate reflection of reality now. But then when the Lord returns, uh, we will see and, and, and know fully, even as we are fully known, because we will see him face to face. We'll understand all these things. We'll be fully mature in loving at that point. But until then, until then, he says, three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. He's saying here, until, until he returns, he's saying spiritual gifts in the work of the kingdom here on this earth are temporary. He's going to wrap that up one day. But faith, hope, and love will last. They are, they are, they are prim primary now. And they will be in eternity. And so here's what he says we're to do in the meanwhile. Jot this down. I didn't make a place for it in your notes. He says we are therefore to hang on to faith. We are to trust steadily in God. We are to hope in God's future unswervingly. And we are to love others extravagantly. Trust steadily in God. Hope in God's future unswervingly and love others extravagantly. So if this is, if this is uh, such a practical passage of Scripture <clears throat> in that we have to ask the question now, once he gives us this, he says, it's essential, I want you to go after it, it's what's important, I want you to love extravagantly, here's what it looks like. Now, he would say, What's your plan? How are you doing? And what is your plan to grow in Christ-likeness, in love for God and for people? What's your plan? Because this is, a, again, this is not just some nebulous, nice thing to spiritual thing to say. He said, I, I intend for you to cooperate with this and cooperate with me. Uh, it, is God, it is the intention of the Lord Jesus to transform the life of every person on this planet into a person who loves God and loves people through Christ Jesus, the way we've described in this message. So what is your plan to grow in love? If you're not making progress, you need to change your plan. Don't stay the way you are. Jesus loves you just like you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay the way you are. And so, uh, what is your plan? Uh, this ability, we taught last week, we discovered that the ability to love in this fashion only comes from love's source, which is a vital growing relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We love because He first loved us. And so, it comes from deciding to live the way that Jesus would live if He were living life through your body, which, by the way, He is, if you're a Christian. It comes, it is deciding to arrange your life and your lifestyle around the habits, around the practices, around the disciplines that Jesus Christ taught and modeled for you and me that kept him vitally linked in fellowship with God the Father. Vi what, what did he tell us to do and what did he model that kept him vitally linked with God the Father? Because if we stay vitally linked with Christ, he by His grace and the power of His Holy Spirit changes our hearts into more loving people. This simply means we, we practice the spiritual disciplines. Not to earn God's favor, but to take us to the place where Jesus is coming by and we can be with Him and He changes us. Uh, so what do you mean spiritual practices? Well, like this one, corporate worship. Habitual corporate worship is a spiritual practice that puts you in a place to be near Christ and be changed by him. Uh, silence, intentional times of silence and solitude, um, Bible intake, prayer, giving, uh, a daily quiet time with God, Bible intake and time in prayer, Sabbath rest, taking a God-designed day off every seven days. Uh, serving in the name of Christ, fellowship with other believers in a group. Uh, there are many, many um, uh, uh, sacred pathways to take you into the presence of Christ where He will change you. 
what is your plan? I, you say, do you have a plan? Yeah, I've, I've got it written down. And I'm constantly reviewing it before the Lord. Um, I, re- I review it. I work. I kind of redo it annually. And um, I, I check it every month and say, you know, Lord, and it, as I discover uh, other ways he wants me to live and rearrange my, my life, I, I, I want to, co- because he gives us guidance. This is one of the reasons our church has what we call the Dogwood Journey. Uh, it's four basic classes that we want every one of you to experience. Everyone who is middle school, uh, all the way up to just before you get in the grave. You know, if you fit in there, we want you to experience these four classes, the belong class, the grow class, the serve class, and the share class. And they're all designed to be starting lines, not finish lines, to, to help you understand some of these uh, basic plans that God has to transform you into a person who loves God completely, loves others compassionately, and loves yourself correctly. Now, you can register for the next class. We want you to take them in order, kind of around the bases. First base is belong. Second base is grow. Third base is serve. Uh, home plate is the share class. We want Grand Slam Christians. And so we'll hope, just like we have a lot of Grand Slams on the part of the Braves, today but anyway another story for another time uh if if you hadn't taken them in order just jump in anywhere but you can register for the next classes we're doing on november the 15th it's really easy you can text the word journey just like it says there journey to our all our world famous number 770-285-1792 and it'll take you to where you can sign up for the next class now nobody's moving but Maybe I need to preach this sermon over again. But anyway, so anyway, I want you to do that. I want you to do that. Jump in. But it's why one of the reasons we, we do this, to help you get your God-designed plan to be transformed by Christ. Well, let me say this before I pray. Musicians, you can come on up. That's not, I'm going to say something besides that. But musicians, come on up. Yeah, there you go. This all begins by becoming a Christian in the first place. And so I would encourage those of you online and who are here in person, if you've never become a follower of Jesus, then today's the day to do that. Repent of your sin, place your tr- active trust in Jesus, surrender to Him as Lord and God of your life, and He will give you His gift of eternal life, adopt you into His family. Now, if you have done that personally and privately, whether it's been in the last... Uh, 30 minutes or the last three decades, his next step for you is to go public with your faith by being baptized. And we are ready to help you celebrate your Christian baptism uh, today. As soon as this service is over, when you exit, if you'll go around the building to the front entrance to our outdoor baptism area, the men and women on our baptism team are there ready to help you Uh, celebrate your baptism today we have everything you need changes of clothes towels dressing rooms heated water you're you're in great you're in great shape Uh, you go and uh, we'll join you there to to celebrate pray with me lord thank you for your amazing grace thank you that you have made a way for us not to be stuck but to be transformed into people who love you and love people. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.
the silence You say there's a treasure Thank you guys so much. You know, I think our prayer for this series is that, man, if you're in a place that you don't know who Jesus is, if you're not a, a follower and a believer in Jesus, that you would experience exactly what that song just said. A love so big and a love so deep that you just can't imagine what you did to earn it. But on the flip side, I think our prayer is that if you are a believer in Christ, that other people would experience at least a glimmer of that love we just sang about from you. And so that's our hope for our, and our prayer for this series. So again, we're so glad that all of you are here today. I hope you enjoyed the service. I do have a reminder for us before we go today. Uh, if you were here last week, you heard us talk about this. It's an opportunity that we have to love on the people of our community in a very physical and tangible way. Right now, the Dogwood Church Real Life Center is hosting a food drive. And so when you came in today, you probably saw the Real Life Center truck out front. And so if you did bring food today, all you need to do is take it over to the truck and that team will take that from you there. If you're here today and you uh, didn't bring food, maybe you forgot or you weren't here last week and you'd still like to participate, there's also a table in the lobby set up with one of our team members from the Real Life Center. And uh, you can make a gift there. You can give monetarily to help those people. But if you're watching from anywhere uh, in, here in our area or anywhere around the world and you would like to participate as well, uh, you can do that by simply going to reallifecenter.org. And again, you can give there as well and help provide food for people who need it right now here in our local ministry area. But again, thank you guys so much for being here. We are gonna be back here next Sunday in person at nine o'clock and 1045 and also online at nine o'clock 1045 and 1230 as well. If you're here in the room with us today, I wanna invite you or ask you to remain in your seats uh, at the end of the service so I can give you some dismissal instructions. But if you're watching online, again, thank you for being here. We will see all of you next Sunday and we hope you have a great week.